such a pleasure to be here. It's my first event as a Verity member. How many members are here tonight? Wow, awesome. Well, welcome to you all, and thank you, Mary, for that introduction. Um, for those of you that do know me, I'm an out-of-town member, so I don't make it here as often as I would like to, uh, but it's just great to see all of you out here today. Uh, just a little bit on my background, for those of you that don't know me, I was in the financial industry for 12 years. That was many moons ago, and this gentleman here was the rock star of the industry. It was, um, he had just an incredibly fabulous reputation then, as he does now. And then I've left the financial industry to write books, as Mary said, and things of that sort for the last 14 years. Uh, a, a former co-worker of mine from Scotiabank, Lisa McMinn, is here, AKA my Spice Girl, and said many years ago, you need to meet Michael. And I'm like, well, how do I do that? And she's like, just call him. And I, I didn't have the guts to do that, but a few years ago, a friend of mine in, uh, invited me to a presentation he was giving at Rotman's, where it was entitled, The Wealthy Invest Differently. And I didn't think that the wealthy invested differently. So I was so curious to hear him speak and I was blown away. I hunted him down. Uh, his office was kind enough to grant me an interview for the Chartered Professional Accountants of Canada. We got him on the cover of that magazine. He had me um, at his compound in Burlington. You were amazing to give me a couple hours of your time, share your story further. And then I hunted him down again recently. <laughs> it has not stopped, not just for this event, uh, but Lana Sinichar is here. She's the publisher of the Canadian Money Saver magazine, and you all have a copy of that here. So thank you for including that for us. So afterwards, people can learn more about Michael's incredible story. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Mr. Michael Eachin. So tonight we're going to um, you know, really get some of Michael's um, framework and, and the best that he's got to give us. And we're also going to have a Q&A, so please think of your questions uh, for afterwards. We will open that up as well. So Michael, first question to you. you. This room knows you very well. They heard your background, but you have this beautiful rags to riches story. Can you tell us a little bit about that? How you did it? That wasn't one of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> I got ambushed. Okay, so I came to Canada in, in 1970 as a student, uh, an engineering student. So I went to McMaster, did engineering, and then uh, went back to Jamaica. I was on a scholarship. So I went back for two years, came back to Canada in 1977. I couldn't get a job as an engineer. So I had three job offers, non-engineering job offers. The first was to be a long haul truck driver. The second was to be a soap salesman. And the third was to become a financial advisor with investors group out of Winnipeg. I opted for the third. So I was 26 years old, strong, stronger accent than now. <laughs> and I knew no one with money. So I had to cold call. So when someone would say, okay, Mike, you can come and see me. I would go to their home, sit around their kitchen table, and I would ask myself the question quietly to myself. <laughs> What's the highest value add I can give to this family here tonight? And the answer kept coming back to me, make them wealthy. That's the highest value an advisor can give to you, right? Make you wealthy, or if you're already wealthy, make sure you're be the, 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 the principles that you used to have created your wealth continue on a go-forward basis. So therefore, as a young engineer in financial planning, I thought, hmm, is there a formula that if you practice consistently, the only outcome is wealth? Is there a formula that if practice consistently, there's no other outcome other than wealth. So, this was in 1977, 78. We didn't have Google at the time. <laughs> so, well, even today, if you were to Google it, nothing would come up, just a bunch of books. But by 1978, I figured it out because I thought, if you want to be successful at any endeavor, there's a three-step process only to 
number one, your teachers, firstly, CPT, identify CPT, a role model. That's what we did. Who before me has really done the best job in the world at that particular endeavor? Be it whether, whether it be being a parent, the prime minister, a teacher, a student, or to create wealth. Identify a role model. Number two, ask the role model, how did you do it? Get the recipe. And number three, don't put your thumbprint on the recipe. Don't change it. Execute it faithfully. So given that, I started looking for role models in wealth creation. And I, what, what I wanted to, what I wanted to, to have identified then uh, was whether there were some common threads between every single wealthy person in the world. I wanted to, if there were some common threads, I wanted to identify what those threads were and codify, codify them and hardwire them and make them a part of me. So by obser observing, uh, create, uh, I came to the conclusion, yes, there is a formula to create wealth. And it's a function of doing five things. So everybody in the world who has created wealth did the following five things. Number one, they own a few high quality businesses. Number one. Number two, they make sure they really understand those few businesses. Number three, they make sure those businesses are domiciled in strong long-term growth industries. Number four, those businesses are uh, use other people's money prudently. And lastly, their attitude towards ownership is very long-term intergenerational. So those are the five things that I identified in 1978 as how the wealthy people created their wealth. And if you think about it, and just think about any wealthy person, I'm sure they'll fit those five criteria. So now, once, uh, once the, the, the hypothesis was proven, I now codified it and hardwired it, and all I've done is lived it. That's brilliant. <laughs> you got a plaid. Um, thank you for that. So thinking about your earlier days, were you always a saver, an investor, and what was your early philosophy when you were just starting to build your wealth? My er <laughs> I can remember in 1981, I was in business for four years, and I bought a home in Ancaster. And this was in 81, September of 81. Bought the home, had a portfolio of mutual funds, cashed in the portfolio of mutual fund, that's funds, bought the home for cash, it was $300,000 at the time, and remortgaged the home to replenish my portfolio. So on, re on remortgaging the ho my home, inter interest rates went up to 23% in 1982. Who remembers that? 23% in 1982. At 23% interest rate, uh, no one wants to, to invest. Why invest when you can get Canada saving bonds that are paying you 19.5%? Who remembers that? <laughs> right? So no one wanted to buy mutual funds. So I bought this house, relatively large house. So one day my friend came and said, Mike, what a beautiful home. But it echoes. <laughs> he said, where's the furniture? <laughs> I, said, I said, Richard, I just bought the home. Interest rates went up. And I re borrowed to invest. So I have my portfolio. And I'm just working to keep maintaining the portfolio. Because interest rates are 23%. So there's no furniture. But one day, I assure you, I'll be, this portfolio will be able to furnish this house every day of the year. So my job right now is to make sure I do everything to keep the portfolio intact. So, so therefore, the, so to, to answer your question directly, short form, yes, I've always uh, believed at the end of the day, wealth creation has a mathematical basis. And if we don't understand the mathematical basis, 
we will be suboptimal in creating wealth. And for those who are who did a course in finance, you recognize, recognize this formula. FV equals PV times 1 plus R to the nth power. Anybody recognizes that formula? The future value of money, money, your net worth tomorrow, is equal to how much capital you have working for you today. Uh, it's also a function of the rate of return you make on your principal, the capital you have working for you today, and time. So, so our job is, as wealth creators, is to make sure if we want to maximize the amount of net worth we have in the future, we have to maximize the amount of money we have working for us today. The PV. Then you get the compounding process starting to work for you. So therefore, how do you maximize PV? The amount of money working for you today. Well, you can marry into it. <laughs> you can win it. You can steal it. Or you can borrow it. But you need to maximize PV to get the compounding process started. Right? So most people are shy to borrow. And you should be shy to borrow if you're borrowing to consume. But you shouldn't be shy to borrow if you're borrowing to invest in high quality assets. So you have to max one has to maximize PV. Hence, I borrowed to invest, I, uh, and my focus in 1982 was to make sure my portfolio was not uh, jettisoned because of high interest rates. I had to do everything to keep my portfolio going. Rate of return, we have to maximize the rate of return. How do you maximize the rate of return with minimum risk? And I'm going to introduce you to a, a concept. Uh, the concept is uh, we have to take advantage of the illiquidity discount. The illiquidity discount to maximize rate of return without any extraordinary risk. So what is, let me explain to you, because this is a concept that is fundamental in, in investing and wealth creation. So, who is the, what's your first name? Lana. 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 If you own, do you own a business? I do. Okay, so one day you may decide to sell that business, right? I love it. No, not yet. Okay, one, <laughs> one day, maybe, maybe. So when you decide to sell that business, Lana, the question is, what's the process you go through, you will go through in selling that business? Well, the first thing you're going to do is call in a Canadian business valuator. How much is this business worth? So the valuator is going to say, Lana, ex tell me about the qualitative aspects of your business. So you describe the business. Thereafter, the value is going to say, may I have your last five years worth of financial statements? And I'm going to come back to you next week with a valuation for your business. So in the ensuing week, or a week later, the valuator comes back and says, Lana, I have a valuation for you. In the ensuing week, what I did, I searched, I scrolled through the TSX, the Toronto Stock Exchange, the New York Stock Exchange, to find a business similar to yours, des descriptively. And I found it. X, if your business was uh, traded on this Toronto Stock Exchange, it would trade like this company, which is similar to yours, at a valuation of 10 times its earnings, right? But because your business is not traded on this exchange, it is illiquid. If your business was traded on the exchange, it would be liquid. And because your business is in liquid, Lana, I have to use the benchmark from a similar business that is public, 10 times earnings, and discount it because it is illiquid. So the, this illiquidity, illiquidity discount ranges from 25% to 40%. So your business, Lana, is not worth 10 times earnings. It's worth somewhere between 7.5 times earnings and 6 times earnings. So Lana is going to say, what? That doesn't make any sense because you are the one, Ms. Valuator, that selected a comparator. And you said you selected an identical comparator. Yes, you're saying that my business 
is which, which have the same business risk profile is 60% less because of one factor, it's not liquid? Yes, Lana, that's how businesses are valued, right? So you're gonna cry the blues. Yeah. <laughs> so? Oita. Oita? Oita is gonna say, I would love to invest in Lana's type of business. And I have a choice. I can go and buy a dollar of earnings on a TSX for $10. Or I can go to Lana. And I heard that Lana's business is worth, for the same dollar of earnings, $6. So I'd rather pay six than 10, wouldn't, you, wouldn't we all? So when you pay $10 for a dollar of earnings, your earnings yield is one divided by 10, 10%. So you're gonna compound at 10%. When you pay $6 for a dollar of earnings, your earnings yield is one divided by six, which is 16.7%, right? So now let's do the math. If you take $100,000, and you compound it at 10% for 40 years, you will end up with $4.5 million. If you take the same $100,000, compound it at 16.7%, because you want that $6 versus 10, so 100,000 compounded at 16.7% uh, for 40 years, you will end up with $47 million. So the question is, what is the price that we are paying for liquidity? The price is the difference between 47 and 4.5, which is 40, $42 million, the price for liquidity. So what I'm saying is, for no incremental risk, we should be all taking advantage of the illiquidity discount. But we need access to do that. So. This is how you maximize the rate of return. And time, the time to start is now because we can't make time. So this formula really determines exactly how wealth is created. And our, as wealth creators, we have to maximize PV, maximize the rate of return, and maximize time. It, uh, it was said, I believe, by Einstein that compound interest should have been the eighth wonder of the world. And would you hear numbers like that and understand that and hear that over time? As you said, can you recap those first five that you had at, at, at the very first question after the recipe? You had those five things. The first is to create wealth. Every single person who has created wealth did five things. Number one, they own a few high quality businesses. Number two, they make sure they really understand those few businesses. Number three, those businesses uh, invariably are domiciled in strong long-term growth industries. Number four, those businesses all use other people's money prudently. And fifthly, the attitude towards ownership is very long term, most likely intergenerational. Yeah, long term. Thank you. Now, uh, all of you in this room know that International Women's Day is approaching this Friday, and there was a new study out by CIBC recently saying that Canadian women control $2.2 trillion of financial assets, and that number is expected to quickly rise to just under $4 trillion in the next decade. Big numbers. Now, I'm also the consumer advocate for the Financial Planning Standards Council. These are the folks that certify the 22,000 and change CFPs across Canada. And we came up with a survey recently that also revealed that 40% of women, not all women, but women in our survey, revealed that they did not think that they were good when it came to investing or finance. They didn't know. Uh, a good chunk were still dependent on um, a spouse, things of that sort. And we know that women live longer, that there's still the, 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 you know, the pay gap. What, how would you suggest women perhaps invest differently, think about their financial futures? Firstly, investing is not that arcane. Right? It's, there are many likenesses between investing and 
living life. The first is, if you want to live a successful life, there are three things we have to do very well. The, fir the first being, we have to make decisions based on a sound intellectual framework, a value system, principles, right? So we need a framework to live a successful life. The second being is we need to, be, we need to have some mechanism that will allow us to control our emotions. So control of emotions. And the third being we need access. Okay, that's, if you have, and by the way, we need all three. If you have the best value system, and you're the most disciplined person, but if you have no access to healthcare, to great, to standards, <coughs> you won't be successful in life. If you have access, and you have control of emotions, but no framework, you're gonna go to jail. So we need all three. And if we don't need, know that we need all three, it's not just gonna fall into our laps. It's not gonna happen. So the first thing we need to do is to be conscious. Investing is no different. You need to have a framework. I just went through a framework for you, with you. The five laws, right? So therefore, know that you have the five laws. When, when, whenever someone says to you, I have a great investment for you, what are you now, now, now gonna do? You're going to say, hold on, let me get my notes out. And let me, my notes will, will be my filter. I'm going to pass it through the sieve of the five laws, right? So now you have a mechanism that will help you to make decisions, the five laws. And if it, and you know, have to just have five tick, tick boxes, and then you can take it to the next step. Control of emotions. It is impossible to control your emotions unless your value system or your framework is absolute. If it's relative, then it is going to be wishy-washy. And thirdly, one has to have access, right? Access to uh, good advice, access to uh, great investment opportunities, access to people you can trust, access to people who, uh, who have experience at creating wealth. And the unfortunate thing is, most of us, and Canada is not unique, most of us, when we think about investing, we go to a broker, a securities broker. Whether we're in Canada or America or Australia, it doesn't matter. But unfortunately, security advisors are not generally trained to create wealth. Unfortunately, they're trained to sell securities. That's, that's, that's the unfortunate reality. So, okay, so. Thank you, thank you very much, Byth. <laughs> Kelly mentioned that the Einstein once said, the eighth wonder of the world is compound interest. And I'm gonna flip between, just to make, uh, make it, uh, uh, to, to, to unmask what you may think is an, un, an, an arcane topic, investing. I'm going to let, always go back to how the, 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 the uh, par parallels between investing and living life, a successful life. Okay. Any mathematicians in the audience? Algebra? None? <laughs> Please don't let me intimidate you. <laughs> okay. Y equals X. Jamie Cole. Is this a line graph of Y equals X, Jamie? Yes. <laughs> Does that yes sound? Are you sure, Jamie? Yes. Are you really sure, Jamie? Yeah. Great, you're right. <laughs> okay. Y equals X to the nth power. Jamie Cole. Is this a line graph of Y equals X to the nth power, Jamie? Are you sure? <laughs> yes. Okay. Y equals minus X to the nth power. Jimmy Cole, 
is that the line graph of y equals minus x to the nth power, Jamie? Minus x to the nth power, yes. The, the mirror image, yes. right? OK. So now, of the line graphs, y equals x, this, and y equals x to the nth power, this, which of those two line graphs would better represent people's expectations? <laughs> y equals x, right? So basically, so now let's label the line graphs. The y-axis, success. X-axis, time. Minus y must be failure. Okay, <clears throat> so what this is saying is, if you take any component of success, say effort, right, or perseverance, as an example, you, over time, you go up this, and you go up the line graph, representing pers perseverance, your expectations, and you travel over time, you get to this point, over time, you're expecting this amount of success, right? That's what this is saying. Am I right? You continue persevering. You put out more effort. You continue going up this line graph to get to this point. You'd expect, because our expectations are linear, you'd expect this much more amount of success, right? That's what that is saying. And you said, of the two line graphs, y equals x better represents people's expectations. Now, tell me, what in life is linear? Is relationship with your spouse linear? Is relationship with your children linear? Nothing in life is linear. The only thing that's linear is a spreadsheet. Right? Nothing in life. In fact, most things in life are better represented by y equals x to the n. Most things in life. So what this is saying now is if you put out effort, you go along this line graph, which better represent most things in life, you get to this point, you are now expecting this amount of success, right? But all you got was this. <laughs> what is the difference between what you expect, which is this, this, and what you actually receive? What's that d delta, the difference called? What's the difference called? <laughs> what? Disappointment. Disappointment. <laughs> Frustration. Exactly. Right? So you say, okay, my mom told me I have to persevere. So I'm going to keep going, putting out more effort. You get to this point, you continue. You get to this point, you're now expecting this amount of success. You have only gotten this amount of success. What's the difference between what you've gotten and what you expected and what you've gotten. What's that delta called? More disappointment. <laughs> so at, at some point, you're going to say, this doesn't work. I'm frustrated. So let me try something else. You try something else, actually what you do is go back to zero. Right? And then you, most people go through this, right? They just don't have the perseverance to get through to the other end. Now, there comes a, a point an inflection point along that curve, whereby before from zero to that point, you put out an inordinate amount of effort, and you get a, uh, an inordinately low amount of success, right? Thereafter, you know, there, after this point, you know, start going up the gradient of the curve, and it flips. You now put out an incremental amount of effort, and you get a disproportionately large amount of success thereafter. Don't we see that in life? Pardon me? Yes. <laughs> but most people don't get to this inflection point. They don't get. So the question is, what is it that we have to do to make sure that we glide through that inflection point naturally, whether it's in life or in investing? What is that thing that we have to do? Well. We have to have a framework. We have to have principles that are absolute. So we would not do anything else. A value system that is absolute. We would not do anything else. This is my life. It's hardwired into me. 
Investing is no different. We have to have a framework. Most people don't have a framework when it comes to investing. No, you do. That's the five laws of investing. Conversely, conversely, the reverse is true. Y equals minus x to the end. Power. In other words, you can behave badly for a while, you get to this point, and nothing shows up. So what now, what now do most people do? They continue behaving badly, whether it's investing or living. They get to this point, nothing shows up. My face is not on the, global, on the front page of the Globe and Mail. But there's an inflection point there, whereby thereafter, you go down the negative gradient of the curve. So just one more small bad behavior, you go to jail. <laughs> Don't we see that every day? So ladies and gentlemen, the eighth wonder of the world, as per Albert Einstein, which Kelly alluded to, isn't necessarily a financial, uh, doesn't necessarily only have financial connotation. It has life connotation. Investing is no different. We have to be armed with a framework. The, our framework is what will help us to control our emotions so we can make consistent decisions. And thirdly, we have to have access. Michael went through this chart with me a couple years ago when he had me back at his office and I've used this in so many of my presentations because it's absolute genius. And can you imagine if you had been taught this early on in your career as a child, how many different decisions you would make? And are you not also sharing this with the youth in Jamaica and trying to help ha have them understand as well that it isn't just about investing, but it's this, 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 you know, this instant gratification society that we're in is very difficult to actually adhere to that? I, I, I think that every, every uh, high school, this should be a fundamental uh, uh, indoctrination in high school because it's relevant to studying, it's relevant to success, it's relevant to investing, everything in life. So here's my burning question. Where do you find yourself right now <laughs> on that curve? Myself? Yeah. Well, I'm 68. I've been, how many years in the business? 41 years, 40, 42 years in the business. I have been consistent because from the get-go, I thought to myself, I have to be con compounding something. What is it am I compounding? If my behavior keep, uh, keeps changing, I'm not compounding anything. So I have to have consistent behavior. That's when you get the compounding effect. So now, at this point in my life, I think I've gone beyond the, f the hockey stick, the flat part, the handle of the hockey stick. <laughs> So therefore, there's now a lot of leverage because as I said, once you get to the inflection point, you put out a, uh, an in, uh, an in, a small amount of effort and the results are disproportionately large. Whether it be because of reputation, because there is now better access, you are, uh, you, you are more intelligent, etc. But now, uh, and you have skill, etc., etc. Can you tell us, and I think this is a burning question for a lot of people in this audience, how you went, you know, how you made it to your first million, but also how you went from millions to billions? So, uh, armed with the framework, remember the framework, the five laws? I said, I remember I was selling mutual funds. And I thought to myself, why do clients buy mutual funds? Why do you buy mutual funds? Isn't, don't you buy mutual funds to create wealth? Right? Why else buy it? Why else would you buy it other than to create wealth? So now let us see whether your stereotypic mutual fund, the behavior, the structure has any resemblance to how wealth is created. Isn't that a reasonable question? If you're buying mutual funds to create wealth, it should have some basis. And if you believe that wealth is created by abiding by those five points, Let's test Every, everything we do against those five points. I said that earlier. So I did that test early in my career. Number one, wealth is created by owning a few high quality businesses. A mutual fund typically has 100, 200 different businesses. Does it pass or fail? The first test. 
Pardon me? Fails. It fails. Secondly, wealth is created by really understanding what you own. If you own a hundred different businesses or two hundred different businesses, is it possible to understand them all? Lana, aren't you just aren't you struggling to understand one? <laughs> huh? So is it possible to, for a human being to understand a hundred? So does your typical mutual fund pass or fail the second test? Fails. It fails. Wealth is created by making sure what you own uh, uh, are domiciled in strong long-term growth industries. If you own 100, some will be in strong industries, power industries, bad industries. Does your typical mutual fund pass or fail? Fails. Three out of five so far. Wealth is created, the fourth is, by making sure that what you own, you're using other people's money prudently. If you own 100 different businesses, are you sure you have 100 crackerjack CFOs? Are you sure? <laughs> so does it pass or fail? And lastly, wealth is created by simply holding what you own for the long term, as you said, Lana, right? The average turnover rate of your typical mutual fund is 80% per year. The inverse of that is the, the average hold period is 14 months. Please, I know of not one wealth per, wealthy person in the world who buys and sells his or her businesses every 14 months. Do you? So I concluded in 1978, having the framework, because the framework is what I'm measuring everything against. It gave me now a yardstick. So I concluded that, holy macros, I'm selling mutual funds, but this thing is dysfunctional. It's dysfunctional relative to why clients are buying it. It should be, in fact, it should be outlawed. I'm extreme, I may be, right? Because, and I had the time of my life in 2017, because I was invited to speak to at the IOSCO conference, which is all this, a conference with all the securities exchange and, and securities commission CEOs, chair, chair, chair persons in the world. So I went through the, exactly what I just went through with, with you. And I said, you manage, you, you're regulating mutual funds. This thing should be outlawed. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, I, I've been, I said to them, I've been waiting for this day in my life. <laughs> no, I have you exactly where I want to, right? So tell me, I may sound outlandish, but where is the flaw in my logic? You securities exchange commissions, commissioners of the world, including the USSCC, Ontario, Alberta, Quebec, Germany, Australia, please tell me, where is the flaw in that logic? They couldn't, they said, you're right. So it's, um, we can make Good decisions only if we have a framework. I could have only come to that conclusion that, generally speaking, mutual funds are dysfunctional because of a framework. So the question now is, what do you do with the framework? So having the framework, I thought, I have to lead by example. So I collapsed all my mutual funds back in 1983, and I took, went and borrowed $500,000, half a million, which was more than my net worth then, and put it into one stock, a stock that met all the five criteria. The name of the stock is McKenzie Financial Corporation. You know McKenzie. So McKenzie, I bought McKenzie in 1983, October 1983, for $1 per share because it met all the criteria. $1 per share with uh, stock splits accounted for in 83. By 87, it was worth $7. I also bought another stock, Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett's company, because again, it met the criteria. Some criteria values driven. So McKenzie, the 500,000, went from $1 in 1983 to $7 by 1987, four years. So 500,000 of board money became 3.5 million. And that reinforced my philosophical basis, hardwired it into me, and gave me uh, a, 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 a financial foundation. Can you talk a little bit about uh, RSP season just passed? And if someone is just investing in, in those traditional types of, of tax shelters, things of that sort, TFSAs, um, you know, what, what are they missing out on? They're missing out on leverage because you cannot, you cannot uh, use leverage to buy your to, to uh, buy your RSP, well, you can borrow for for to, to buy the RSP, but you can't leverage it. Mm -hmm. 
So you cannot create wealth if you are not maximizing PV. So the, 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 if you were, to, let me give you an example. Uh, if you had uh, $10 per year, right, to spend, and interest rates are 10%, you can uh, uh, take the $10 a year and put into your RSP every year, right? In, in 10 years, you'd have $100 built up. Or you can go today and borrow $100 today, PV, right? Maximizing PV. You borrow $100 today and take the $10 and pay the interest on that loan, which becomes tax deductible. So now you have PV working for you. So, so that is a base, a fundamental flaw in the RSP program. And it's not on my approved question list, but it came up from, from our first interview. And when you would sit down with couples and you would see, I remember you telling me the story that you would see they couldn't make it. They couldn't make it to their retirement the way that they were going. If they were going to save their $500 a month or what have you. But as soon as you showed them that if the amount that they borrowed and then used the $500 to pay it off or whatever the amount is, what a, what a shift, what a difference, how that would make or break their retirement. Do you, are you still feeling that same kind of um, um, you know, fear of leveraging for important things as opposed to uh, getting into more debt for, for consumption? Well, 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 principles are principles. They don't change. Uh, and especially if it's mathematical, mathematically based. Uh, so it, when it comes to debt, a lot of us are conservative. Uh, but we should be, yes, we should be conservative when it comes to debt for consumption. But if it comes to debt to own high quality businesses, we should distinguish. We shouldn't just let our conservativeness room to owning high quality businesses. So you're the chairman of the largest bank in Jamaica. Uh, can you talk about why you took on that role, your journey, and, and some of the successes? <clears throat> the, 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 in terms of investing, uh, the, there, there are three preconditions that have to be met before I really get excited and salivate. <laughs> <laughs> the first is, there must be a difference between perception and reality. Because only when there's a difference between perception and reality can do you have the knowledge arbitrage. And you cannot create wealth unless there is knowledge arbitrage. So I am there. I seek out to try to find that, that discrepancy between perception and reality. So the only way to, you can find that discrepancy is if you have boots on the ground. You actually go and see for yourself, right? The reality. When you read a newspaper, that's you. You're, you're, you're being flooded with perceptions, right? The second precondition. Uh, before creating excess wealth is that they also, with respect to the first, the flip side is also true. If there is no uh, delta difference between perception and reality, in other words, if everybody knows the same thing, you can't create any wealth. If there's efficiency of information, you can't create any wealth. So I'm looking for inefficiency of information. That's the first. The second being, uh, there must be uh, general inefficiencies, whether it be regulatory, whether it be cultural inefficiency, whether it be political, whether it be just, li uh, just general inefficiencies, whatever the, the bureaucracy, etc. So I, look, I seek out those situations. And the third is, I see, try to find, I get ex really excited for uh, when there is a lack of equity capital going into the sector, the region, uh, the business, only then, when there's a lack of equity capital, can you get a great deal. And uh, uh, you can buy at great value. And all three preconditions must be present to minimize risk. So the first being, there must be a discrepancy between perception and reality. Second being, there must be uh, inefficiencies. And thirdly, uh, there must be a lack of equity capital flowing into the area. So therefore, I, I seek those situations out. Most people run from them, right? Uh, so when the National Commercial Bank of Jamaica was, was 
uh, it was an amalgam consisting of the Royal Bank of Canada and Barclays Bank amalgamated to form NCB, National Commercial Bank of Jamaica. It was mismanaged, it, went, uh, it was taken over by the government, and they, were, you know, they cleaned it up, were shopping it, no one wanted it. But it met all three, Jamaica met all those three, all three, those three preconditions. The bank met, met those three preconditions. So it was the three preconditions squared. <laughs> so I, I, I bought, this was in 2002, and what I saw was the following. Scotia Bank went to Kingston, Jamaica, before it came to Toronto. Scotia Bank. Scotia Bank went to Kingston in 1888. Codfish rum trade. Jamaica was the first country that Scotia Bank expanded out of Canada to. In 2001, Scotia, Scotia, Scotia Bank was in 50 countries. Scotia and uh, including Jamaica. Scotia International, which would be the, the other 49 countries except for Canada, Jamaica comprised 25% of Scotia International's after tax earnings. 50 countries, Jamaica was 25%. Scotia, the, the entire Scotia business, Jamaica in 2001 was 8% of Scotia, Scotia's after-tax earnings, one island. So I thought, wow, here's an opportunity. Scotia will tell you, therefore, that their business in, in Jamaica is fantastic. So they, they know the difference between perception and reality. Their reality is, they know the reality could be because they have been there since 1888. But most people don't see Jamaica as a treasure trove for great investing. But Scotia knows it was. So it met Having the three criteria, NCB met the three criteria, the job now was just make it efficient and transform it in from a bureaucratic, low confident, low moral organization into a selling machine. And that's what we did. And that's just, that's just one example, there are, there are many others. Yeah. So we just have one more question that I'm going to ask Michael, and then we're going to open it up to you. So think about any questions that you have. Um, so the last one, Michael, is philanthropy is obviously very important to you, as it is to many women in this room. Uh, you have several multi-million dollar donations. What advice can you give to others thinking of creating their own legacy, especially because it is important to a lot of women, and I know a lot of women in this room? Okay, so about 15 years ago, I was on vacation in my favorite vacation spot in the world, Port Antonio, Jamaica. Uh, <laughs> uh, so one day, one morning, I was at the marina, so I walked, it got up at 6 a.m., went walking to the other end of the marina, and I saw this young man. So I stopped and said, what are you doing? What's your name? He said, my name is John Shaw. I said, so John, what do you do for a living? He said, well, I'm a landscaper, in other words, uh, and how, how often do you work, John? He said, intermittently. So we had a, little, a nice chat. Just before I left him, I said, you know, John, you have one commodity on your hand, which is time. Time, it can be like a two-edged sword. It can hurt you or it can feed you. Make sure you use it well. So when I left John Shaw, now I'm from Port Antonio. I was born in Port Antonio, and my mother uh, is an orphan and she had me when she was 18 years old, and I was telling Kelly earlier, when she had me, uh, uh, my, by then my father had taken off, he went to England, so I didn't know him, uh, and she was an outcast in the society, and she was taken in by the helpers in the local supermarket. So for six months, she didn't have a job, and she had this baby, and being taken in by the helpers. So John Shaw, when I left John Shaw, I thought to myself, John Shaw, John Shaw. When John Shaw's children look out at the horizon, or when John Shaw, as he was doing then, that morning, what does he see? Does he see blue skies? Does he feel optimistic? Does he know that tomorrow is gonna to be a better day than today? When my children look out at the horizon, what do they see? Do they think tomorrow is gonna to be, do, are they, do they think tomorrow is gonna to be better than today? Are they optimistic? Do they see blue skies? 
In John Shaw's case, the answer was no, no, no. In my children's case, the answer is yes, yes, yes. So the question is, what's the difference between John Shaw and Michael Lee Chin? We both came from the same place. It's only by the grace of God, basically. When jo what John Shaw does not have, and it's most likely his children will not have, unless there's an intervention, he doesn't have a voice in the system, nor power in the marketplace. What we all have in this room here, we have a voice in the system and power in the marketplace. So the question is, those of us who have it, a voice in the system and power in the marketplace, and by the way, it's not wholesale, everybody doesn't have it in the world. What are we going to do with it? Well, we have to be conscious that we have it. So what are we going to do with it? So it became, John Shaw, that story crystallized what I'm telling you. So my, my conclusion was I'm blessed because, number one, I was born in a country that made me conf a confident human being. I didn't choose the country in which I was born. I was blessed. I was born to parents, to a lady, a mother, who had high values, standards of expectations. She lived them. I didn't choose her, I was blessed. I was born in an era that I can own a pencil. I can get educated. Had I been born 250 years ago, I would have been owned. So being conscious of the fact that we are here today based on many factors that we had no say in. The country in which you're born, the parents, your parents, and the era in which you're born. Wow, what are our responsibilities to everybody who were born in an era in which they're, they, they are a total misfit? Or they're born to parents who had no standards, no values, and they led them astray. Do you have any responsibility to them? There's so many things about Michael that impressed me, impressed me. Uh, his framework, his, his way of thinking, his taking that engineering degree and really applying it, I think, to the world of, of finance. And I too grew up with a single mom and, and, and came from the humblest of beginnings. But what impressed me most when I left his office was him asking me, what is going to be your legacy? And I was on such a mission to help Canadians feel good about money, and I still am, but it was like, what is going to be your legacy? And that's such a powerful question, and I'm still working on it. <laughs> but, oh, yeah. remember, remember the hockey stick curve, right? <laughs> exactly, I have a long ways to go. So thank you for that, Michael. We're gonna open the floor now to questions, and oh yes, and also you have, um, in your folders, you have some evaluation forms. If you could fill that out, we'd really appreciate it to let us know how this event was for you. Um, and if you can fill it out during the questions and maybe like pass them that way and pass them that way so people can pick them up, we're going to do a draw at the end of the questions as well for a couple of my books and some beautiful Mandeville uh, portfolios as well. I didn't come here to be self-promotional, right? But I'll just, I'll just uh, go, go through with you an experience I had. That in, two, in 19, no, sorry, in 2007, please have a seat, Barbara. Huh? <laughs> In 2007, I had sold a business, Berkshire Investment Group. We had a thousand advisors across 300 offices in Canada, and I sold it to a large insurance company. And at the time, I sold it, I got cash and shares of this large insurance company in 2007. And the sheer price I got for the, 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 the sale was, the share, the share price then was $40 per share. So I thought to myself, well, uh, if it's $40 per share now, and as we know, uh, the, uh, if you invest at 7%, money will double in 10 years, right, rule of 72. So in 10 years, from 2007 to 2017, the $40 per share should be worth $80 per share. That was the assumption I made then. And dividends will also increase uh, proportionately. The reality is in 2008, fall of 2008, we had a financial crisis. And the stock price went from 40 to nine. 
today it's still 22. It should be, it should be, in 2017, it should have been 80. It's still 22. Fortunately, I got some cash and I took the cash and co-founded the business in the Caribbean by the name of Columbus Communications with another Canadian entrepreneur. His name is John Risley from Clearwater. Anybody knows John? Okay, Clearwater Seafoods. So we started this business in 2006, 2007. And the business met all the three criteria uh, I, I, I mentioned. Uh, firstly being uh, difference between perception and reality, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we started a telecommunications business. The long and short of it is there was an a huge inefficiency, cable and wireless, which was the incumbent telecommunications company. They were charging $48,000 per month for a T1 line, which was crazy. So we decided to build our own undersea cable and we bought another network. Long and short is we sold that business for $3 billion by 2013. It was the largest transaction in Latin America in 2013. The reason I tell, the, I, I go through this with you, is that if I had not done that, and if my entire portfolio was in the proxy for the stock market, which was the, 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 the $40 stock, which went to nine, I would not be sitting here. I would be totally miserable today, <laughs> right? What saved my bacon because of the crash was the fact that I invested in this business and it went well, really well. So in, by 2011, I was doing a post-mortem on the, on the financial crisis. And I thought to myself, how did I get through the crisis? And I concluded I got through the crisis because of the private businesses that I owned not the public businesses, as per that proxy I just went through with you. But I'm a financial advisor, and all my clients, their portfolio was 100% publicly traded securities, all my clients. So I felt terrible. I said, that, Mike, you're a hypocrite. Because you've always pride yourself on leading by example, and it, you didn't realize that your personal portfolio was different from your clients, and you are their advisor. So I could have done two things. I could have sailed off into the horizon and said, what, what do I care? Every advisor is doing it anyway, so why should I care? That's, that's, that was one option. Or I could have said, you know, I care because I would not be sitting here tonight if I didn't have clients. I know better. So I'm gonna go through the, I'm gonna start a business that will give clients access to what hitherto then was the purview of only the, wealthy, the wealthiest entities from CPP, Ontario teachers, or the wealthiest individual. So I'm gonna start a business that will democratize what has been hitherto now accessible only to Ontario teachers, CPP, etc. And that's what we did. It's unique in the world. So, I didn't come here to, to advertise, but you asked the question, and the only company in the world that, is, that has taken that approach is Mandeville. Excellent question, Rosalie. Excellent question. Uh, because now we're, now we're going to talk about uh, the details of portfolio allocation. How should you allocate your capital, your portfolio? Uh, and let's go back to role models. Who are the role models? Let's go back to CPP. Uh, CPP, Canada Pension Plan, we, we, we hope that their asset allocation is prudent or else we're all going to be in trouble when it's time to collect. So we hope. CPP's uh, asset allocation would consist of 50% public securities, 50% private securities. Now, within the private sec segment of their uh, portfolio allocation, there would be uh, silos, investment silos. Within the private sector, the public sec segment would be for liquidity, right? 
the private segment is where they get they take advantage of the illiquidity discount. Remember when she was illiquidity discount? That's where they get growth. The real what they call alpha, right? Uh, so it's from the private segment because they're able to take advantage of the illiquidity, illiquidity discount. So, so therefore, what they do is uh, they would have in the, within the private sector, uh, 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 they would have private equity, they would have direct ownership of businesses, they'd have resource, natural resources, they'd have real estate, uh, private, and they would, they would have some venture, right? So venture may be uh, 5%, right? But within the venture ca category, they would now diversify between probably 30 different venture companies because they know that's high risk. But if they, they diversify enough, one, one company uh, giving them a 10x will make up for many losses, right? So that's the way they, they, would, they would position it. So, so uh, from the standpoint, and so we should emulate, we should seek to emulate their portfolio allocation as, as individuals. But most of us as individuals, we have 100% of our portfolio liquid in publicly traded securities. In other words, we're actually saying, I know for a fact that 10%, remember 10% is greater than 16%. Because you, if, if, if and so is 10% greater than 60%? No. So why is your portfolio 100% liquid? Because your behavior is suggesting that you, you're saying, 10% is greater than 10, 16%, or is your portfolio would not be reflecting that. So in terms of an investor, you, you're, 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 you should be diversified between liquid and illiquid. So the first conversation one should have with your investment advisor is what percentage of my portfolio should be liquid versus illiquid. Because you want to, contrary to how uh, most advice is given. You definitely don't, don't want a portfolio that's 100% liquid. You don't want to minimize the liquid portion and, it, uh, and maximize the illiquid portion. So the first conversation, to take advantage of the illiquidity discount. And within that illiquid portion, the private sector, you diversify, as, as I've mentioned. That's from the standpoint of an investor. Now from the standpoint of you the sponsor of a venture, uh, uh, venture, a venture, that would, that's a longer conversation. That's a long, that's a long, because it depends on the business. It depends on the business. So it, it's a longer conversation. I can't give you a generic answer. I'll be massacring the, 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 the question. <laughs>you heard the question? Did you all hear the question? What else is necessary to take Jamaica from its traditional tourism business, which basically is an all-inclusive format, to the next, the next uh, level? Uh, in my role as, I'm the, the, in 2016, the Prime Minister of Jamaica appointed me to be the Chairman of the Economic Growth Council for Jamaica. Uh, so in my role, and as a chairman, my job is to advise the government as to a set of policies uh, to uh, en uh, en enable the country to, to grow. That's my responsibility. So tourism is one area that has been uh, one of the four large muscles in terms of the economy. Uh, uh, but the, the, tourist f the format of the industry today is such that only the hoteliers make money because it's an all-inclusive and the bookings are done outside of the country in a, in a St. Lucian company through the, and the, 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 the hoteliers only send enough money to pay their expenses and they keep all the profits out of the country. And worse yet, the, the industry only hires a, a mass of low, uh, low echelon uh, staff, waiters and cleaners. Now, that is not a good industry. From, for, so we need to go, go up the value chain uh, in terms of the, the tourist industry. And, but the first is, so, so uh, one, of the, uh, one of the recommendations is to get into the health tourism industry. 
because that is now high value and we're very close to the, on to the doorstep of North America and it's very expensive. Me he delivering healthcare in North America is expensive and people are, uh, North Americans are going to Indonesia, Philippines to get their cataracts done, their knee surgery, uh, hip surgery, etc. Why not do it in Jamaica? So that is something we're working on uh, and also the, 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 there, there is an opportunity for us that small countries have that they have not capitalized on. It's to be legislatively nimble. Legislatively nimble. So what do I mean about that? What do I mean by that? Large countries are, are, have become more bureaucratic and regulatory, regulatory uh, uh, lead-footed, right? Large countries. And I'll give you an example. For, for uh, are, we out of are we running out of time? Oh, no, we're still okay for a couple minutes. <laughs> I'll, give, I'll, give an okay. I'll give you an example. Tell me to shut up, okay? <laughs> I'll give you an example. For a, for, for a drug, a, pro, a, a medical a protocol uh, to be recommended as a treatment in North America, the United States, or Canada, it has to be federal, the protocol has to be federally approved. It cannot be approved recommended by the doc by doctors if the protocol is not federally approved it cannot be recommended so there's a bureaucracy to get drugs approved and there are gatekeepers the big farmers who if they spent a billion dollars on a particular drug they are going to do their hell best to keep out uh, any drug that may just be uh, may, may, may just disrupt their cash flow Drug companies are in the business to make money. They love chronic. They don't love cure, right? <laughs> cure doesn't pay. <laughs> they love chronic. So, so now, whereby, uh, in Germany as an example, for a protocol to be accepted, all you need is patient doctor consent. That's all you need. So, with, so what does that mean? It means that Germany is ahead in many way areas because they're not clogged down by bureaucracy and they can try different things. One example is, again, is, uh, is so, so therefore, if countries like, countries like Jamaica, they are, they, if they are legislatively nimble, they could make, make they have legislations facilitate uh, these new treatments. So uh, uh, North Americans don't have to die. And I can give you a specific example. If you have metata metastatic uh, prostate cancer or pancreatic cancer, in North America, you will die. That's end state, you're end state. In Germany, you're not. Because they have a treatment called PRRT, peptide uh, receptor radionuclide therapy. It's targeted therapy. We don't have it here in North America, it's just coming. Uh, so countries can, small countries have the opportunity to build an industry by having, being legislatively nimble. They can build a healthcare industry, in this case to treat cancer, North American metastatic, pancreatic, breast, colon, uh, not colon, uh, 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 prostate as an example. So it, it's just a matter of being more thoughtful as to how industries are designed. You see, it comes, up, it comes back to framework. So you see, what I'm looking for, I look for inefficiencies and then transform a business from being inefficient to efficient, right? right? So in that transformation, that's where you, you create a lot of wealth. But you, so you have to know exactly, so what are we transforming to? Right? So let me just, so now let's, let's I, what I gave you, the, the framework I gave you uh, would, be, would have been a, a framework that is relevant to how wealth is created by investors. Right. Let us now take a look at how companies create wealth. Well, firstly, in terms of ownership, right? And if you think of a private business and the characteristics of a private business, you, you, you will define exactly how, you will identify and crystallize exactly how companies create wealth. Because the, the characteristics 
of wealth creation are embodied in private businesses. So, let, here we go. First, in terms of ownership. A private business is usually has uh, the owner and operator embodied in one. You, Roslyn, you are an owner operator, am I right? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, first characteristic. And what does that mean? It means that you minimize agency risk because you're right every day, you're the owner and you're gonna make sure that everything is done most efficiently and creatively, right? If you hired someone and who, who, who you know, have an agent, that agent isn't gonna be as resolute, as cautious, as uh, creative as you are, right? Okay, so t first characteristic of a wealth creating company is that it is run it's, uh, or a private business, is own, the owner operator is one, the same entity. Secondly, your business, Roslyn, a private business, uh, has a few owners, probably one or two. Three. Three, exactly, few, few owners, right? Your business would be, could be described as being uh, entrepreneurial, private business, typical. You're busy, periodically, when you get to the point where you're, you're making a profit, and by the way, there's personal identification between Roslyn and the business, and the business and Roslyn, am I right? Yes. So I'm defining the characteristics of wealth creating businesses. Your business, periodically, every day you wake up, you think, how am I gonna grow this baby? Growth, 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 is what you think about every day, am I right? You, you're, you're, you're thinking also long term, right? Long term. And validation of success would be increased revenues, increased profits, margins, customer satisfaction, right? So those are some of the characteristics. And periodically, when you, make a, when you get to the point where you're making a profit, you don't, have to, you don't have the challenge of what do I do with these profits? How do I allocate the profit? And if it's a good allocation, your net worth increases. If it's a bad allocation, you could go bankrupt. So those are the characteristics. So, so in other words, it's the capital allocation uh, metaphor where you flip a coin, heads you win, tails you lose, right? It's symmetrical, right? So those are the characteristics of your business, your private, on all private businesses. Those are the characteristics, by the way, as how companies create wealth. Now, if your business is really successful, an investment banker is gonna come and, come and say, Roslyn, let me take your business public. So now let us look at what happens the day after, right? There's a separate, right, the day before, owner operator is embodied in one person or a couple of people. The next day is public, you have a separation between the owners and the operators, separation between shareholders and management. That's your typical public company, am I right? And because of that separation, to maintain order, you have to now interpose a corporate governance structure. Board of Directors. Who are these board members? How much ownership do they have? In, they could have not, no, no ownership. So they're agents. So you have just, in separating the owners from the operators, you have now just introduced agency risk. So you have the Board of Directors overseeing management. Who, are, who is the management? They don't have to own. They're just hired guns, right? So you have Agents overseeing agents, board of directors overseeing management. So you have agency risk squared. You minimize agency risk by being the own operator. Right? So that's the first problem. Secondly, there is, where there is personal identification between Roslyn and her business, and the business and Roslyn. Who owns BCE? Can you put a face to BCE? Or tell us? You can't. It's amorphous. Right? Uh, whereby you are entrepreneurial. Large public companies are not. They're bureaucratic because the individuals, staff, management, board, their first responsibility is don't lose your job. So they're gonna be layers so that you can, so that you're to protect themselves. So you have a bureaucracy versus being entrepreneurial. Whereas periodically you have to make a capital, every day you wake up and think growth, growth, growth. Your typical public company, board of directors starting off, their focus is risk and compliance. Whereas you were long-term in your thinking, typical public company, short-term, quarterly. Whereas when you make a profit, you have to allocate it. If it's a good allocation, 
your net worth increases, it's a bad all allocation, you go bankrupt. Symmetrical. In a public, typical public companies, management and board, they get together, may, having made a profit, if it's a good, uh, they, they don't have to allocate the profit also. If it's a good allocation, management gets a bonus. If it's a bad allocation, management gets half the bonus. If it's a really <laughs> ugly allocation, management gets a golden parachute. So it's time to flip a coin, heads they win, tails they don't lose. <laughs> right? Another characteristic you're thinking long term, here's short term, quarterly. And validation of success, stock price, mark the market. So what you have, you have the, you have the characteristics, that the 10 characteristics that I went through as a typical of private businesses that are wealth creating. The very next day when they become public, they do the opposite. They are, the characteristics are the exact opposite. So we as uh, sensible people, we should now look for, if we are investing, whether public or private, we look for companies with those 10 characteristics. Well, yeah, that's a framework. So you want to build a business with those characteristics and make sure that however big, large business or successful the business become, those 10 characteristics are maintained. I know we could keep Michael all night long, and we could keep you, but we promise to keep you right till around eight, and we're just a couple minutes after eight. I don't know if you, are you gonna be staying around for a few minutes afterwards for, for questions? Uh, not too, too much, I have, to go to, much I have to go to Burlington. But what's very exciting is again, thanks to Lana um, that also has that publication that you all are walking away from with more of the wisdom of what Michael was talking about today so you can study it and recap it. Michael, our heartfelt thanks that you were here tonight to share your expertise and insights. Can we have a big round of applause for Michael?